Listen, egghead, let me bring you up to date Excuse on what's me. been... Let me... Excuse me! Is there food? I'm running this monkey farm now, Frankenstein! And I want to know what the fuck you're doing with my time. Salute that walking pile of pus. Salute my ass. In terms of uh, my early day days of acting, uh, which started long before I met George Romero, uh, I, uh, I think all actors have this in common. Um, I realized as a child when we boys would play army, I don't know if you still play army anymore, uh, maybe they play terrorists now, but I, I knew that I died better than my friends when, when you'd shoot them with the invisible machine gun. Da -da 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 -da. Around that same time, I be became an altar boy in, in the church. Uh, I was a good, good Catholic schoolboy. And there was something about the, um, the spectacle and the costume and the, and, the, and the separation of the audience and, and, and the clergy that all kind of drew me unknowingly to, to the theater. And I realized when I was in school, I was studying pre-law. And um, they had auditions for Tennessee William play, and I auditioned, and, and then I figured I didn't want to be a lawyer. There were so many TV law shows on when I was a child. I wanted to be the guy playing the lawyer, which then drove me to my studies with the Grotowski in Poland, uh, Joe Chaikin in America, the Method in New York, uh, and I lived pretty much through the whole heyday of the experimental theater days of the 70s. And I ended up in Pittsburgh. I became a local actor in Pittsburgh. There were, like here, the provinces, there were five or six theaters. And George, at the time, was based in Pittsburgh and was very, very uh, appreciative and knowledgeable of the local Pittsburgh acting scene. So whenever he cast a movie, he would go to New York he would go to Los Angeles, but he would always have a session for the Pittsburgh actors. And uh, I had done a, a small film called Effects, which is out on Dimensions now, which I think we shot it in 79 and didn't because of litigation purposes, didn't get a release till a few years ago. And that was directed by uh, uh, one of George's collaborators and Booba, which, who did a lot of editing for George, Tony Booba, was the sound man on that film. So I became part of the Pittsburgh film family. So when the casting called, my first meeting with George was for uh, Dawn of the Dead. Uh, I went in and I read for the part of the helicopter pilot, David Emge. Gotta find fuel. I, I didn't get the part of the, the helicopter pilot, and uh, that's how I got the loading dock scene, which in the American uh, version was, is cut pretty substantially. Uh, what's the problem, officer? We caught your friends here stealing company gasoline. What do you mean, friends? They know, Raj. They're running too. 
Now, uh, it'd be crazy to start shooting at one another, wouldn't it? Sure would. So I had one in the can for George. In fact, I'm one of the few actors that can say he's done three Romero movies because George t tends not to re reuse people. He just doesn't. Um, then he did a, a wonderful overlooked movie, I think, th that should definitely have the makings of a remake, Night Riders. I had a wonderful scene with Ed Harris. And had I been able to ride a motorcycle, uh, I would have had a, a much bigger role. And then a, a few years later, now don't forget, Dawn had kind of made the cover, you know, it was mentioned in Time Magazine and the shopping mall. And, um, you know, it made, it made a lot of noise. So I, I maintained my activity uh, in the theater scene in Pittsburgh. And then George held auditions for Day of the Dead and said, I'd like you to come in and read for Rhodes. And I was, yeah. And uh, so I read and he said, wait, well, we'll go, we're going to Los Angeles and then we're going to New York and we'll let you know in a couple of weeks. And uh, in a couple of weeks, I got a phone call that I was Rhodes. <laughs> The fascist military leader, um, it took a little bit of, uh, at first read uh, of the script and the character, he uh, was a military leader in my mind. Um, and as with all of George's movies, uh, there usually ends up being I, less intentional than people think, but there's always a very strong political uh, diatribe that's being formed in the movie. And the more I read the script, the more I understood that the basic conflict of the script was three very s strong point of views coming into collision. One was the military point of view, which is shoot them in the head. I don't care. They're dead. Let's kill them. Where does it say we should do any one thing but shoot the mothers in the head? So we had Rhodes, the military, Logan, the uh, um, uh, uh, med medicine, scientific. Uh, Bob's been responding so well lately, I let him live. And then Terry Alexander's role, the helicopter pilot. People got different ideas concerning what they want out of life. Which was more of that Haitian, uh, Rastafarian, you know, Sada, the world, you know, with sitting in the in the Winnebago with her, and it's all going, it's madness. You ain't never gonna figure it out. So you, you had a, a kind of spiritual collision, too, and and uh, Rhodes's fascism. Uh, the more I read the script, was he probably didn't start out as a fascist, but as a real prick of a military man. But when the uh, proverbial uh, shit hit the fan down in the cave, uh, I think that he was kind of forced uh, into that position, but kind of enjoyed it. He would have shot Sarah. What the fuck is wrong with you people? They're dead. They're fucking dead. Yeah, he's a mean old son of a bitch. In terms of the, 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 the political uh, timing of uh, Day of the Dead, it's kind of a twofold question. Um, Politically, I, I, I'm very much to the left. Uh, I was all set to go, go to Canada if I didn't fail my draft physical. Uh, I've been chased and maced in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, I, I was at the Washington Monument when the police came and their motorcycles and chasing us and swinging their clubs uh, like it was out of at some knight's tale running back to the buses, tear gas, uh, throwing red paint on the Pentagon. 
when you're when you're working on a George movie, you what what appears so obviously political after the fact, after viewing it, but when you're in the middle of the process of it, your your mind is 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 much more in the storytelling. I was worried about hitting my marks getting my lines right, were we going to be able to live up to the expectations that had been created in the mall in Dawn of the Dead? You know, we, we, we're, the next, we're the next generation now. We're up to the plate, as they say in baseball. And are we going to hit it out of the park or not? Anybody else have any questions about the way things are going to run around here from now on? The whole sense of, of, of answering back, as you said, you pointed out Reaganomics and, 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 the, and the brutal, brutal uh, world strategy that was going on and being maintained at the time. It, it was not really, you know, an actress got a, a lot of work just making a living. The story I always love to tell about George, uh, show you the kind of uh, humble gentleman uh, that he is, is uh, I'd, w I'd wake up in the morning, and we never saw any daylight when we shot the film. We were in the cave all day, 12, 16 hours a day, and then we were back at the, this large hotel called the Holodome, which was like a spaceship. There it is. There it is. You didn't have to leave for anything. Um, we all got very sick being in the cave because of the dampness and the and the uh, humidity. We had this doctor on set who uh, was kind of a crazy, almost like the Beatles song, Dr. Roberts. Uh, he was the feel-good guy. I mean, because as I said, people were going down, so B12 shots were, you know, here and uh, um, anti-pain. Medic, you know, people would just. I was out of work for three days. I was so sick. Uh, but one, I would wake up in the morning at about five o'clock, and I I go down to breakfast and uh, know that the teamster driver was going to be there to drive me to the set after I finished my breakfast. And you know, but I, I recall one very cold, cold morning. I I got up and I opened the curtains to my window and I let up a cigarette, was just looking out the window, and I see this figure in the parking lot scraping the ice off of the windshield of a car. And I look and it's George. And I'm going, my God, this guy's directing all day. He's looking dailies at night. You know, you would think he would be the first person that, that would have the, the town car driver, you know, be just taking him to and from the set. And he's up at the crack of dawn, scraping, you know, something that one of his uh, the gopher or, or or one of his runners or assistants should have been doing. Uh, he brings that quality with him to the set. He knows exactly what he wants, but he also is shrewd enough to know that he may find something out by taking a suggestion. At that time, we knew that George had submitted his final draft and that it was severely um, cut back for budgetary purposes. That's why I said that the, the, the containment and the claustrophobia of the mine and the only really external shot. I mean, there was there were these brilliant scenes of, of zombie roundups, helicopters, uh, you know, guys going through the, the, the Everglades, roping uh, zombies, throwing them in trucks, herding them back. But the script, uh, once it was cut, was really uh, kept on, under wraps, the original one. Uh, I don't think, I, I actually, it's been around and been available uh, on the internet. I actually didn't get around to reading it until about... Uh, five years ago, 
Uh, you know, we basically knew that we should have had a lot more money and a lot more fun and all of us perhaps would have gone to shoot in the Everglades as opposed to just being stuck in the mine and that, that was basically all that we, all that we knew. You work with what you got. I, I read basically the new one. It was strictly Rhodes. It was strictly in the new one. It was a military man from, from the get-go. I knew nothing about that Rhodes was originally more of a Dr. No figure, uh, you know, uh, would have been a, a whole different, it's still ruthless and, and, and still maniacal, but, you know, not really wearing, uh, you know, the military, the military badge. This ain't a goddamn field trip, people. I had met Tom on a, uh, uh, a uh, production of uh, the Leather Stocking Tales. And he was, you know, that was Indians, and he was, uh, he was doing the special effects, bow and arrow shots and uh, musket shots and things like that. And uh, then I, I had met him once or twice uh, on the set and, and, and just in passing, you know, very, very casual. And about a day after that, I was walking down the street and this car screeched its brakes and pulled right next to me, a little blue BMW, and, and this guy gets out of the car as though he's furious. And I'm going, wait a minute, I know this guy. And it, it, but it's all happening very fast. And he runs to his trunk and he takes his keys and he opens up his trunk and he pulls out an ax. And now I'm starting to see my life flash before my eyes. And as he's coming forward with the ax, I, I just in the split second, I realized it was Tom Savini and the ax, he came down full force on my head with the ax, but it was rubber. And, you know, visually Tom is the owner who's so skilled and he's so good, uh, I, you know, I, I really couldn't tell. And he just, you know, he just, he, I, I knew then that he was a, he was a madman. Say goodbye, creep. I got to be very, very good friends with him. I would go over to his house in Pittsburgh and drink wine with his father, who was a great man, talk about tomatoes in the garden and Italian food. Uh, um, but on the set, uh, uh, Tom, uh, Greg Nicotero, all those guys, they, they were, uh, I mean, they were constantly prepping and working, but they had a huge laboratory in the mine. Uh, and that was the place where everybody hung out. In fact, they'd have to throw us out sometimes because, you know, they'd have the music blaring and they're slopping blood and building rib cages. And, uh, you know, he, the, 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 he, Tom, 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 when Tom is working, you know, it, it's, it's, he has a very good sense of relaxation. It's Savini land. We didn't improvise a lot in the sense of random improvisation, which can you could just beat a scene to death. Uh, but p we did speak about the dynamics of the scene quite a bit. And you know, we average maybe eight, 10 takes, uh, excuse me, per scene, except for my death scene, which is a whole other story. That was, that was a one shot. Uh, but for instance, I mean, I have two, two of the classic lines from the film came not in a sense out of an improv. Uh, the most famous one, Choke on Him, When I Die, was not in the film. And the day I came in for my death scene, I, I said, George, I don't think that Captain Rhodes would uh, go down without saying a word. And he said, Joe, look, your, your legs are being torn apart. 
your stomach's being ripped open. Uh, your larynx is probably going to, how could you, I said, George, if they're worrying about that, I'm saying, I'm saying Captain Rhodes ain't going out without saying something. And, and he said, well, what, 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 what could you possibly say? And I felt a little shy. I didn't want to say the line with any intention. So he, this big bear of a guy, he leans over and I said, I'm going to whisper in your ear. And I, 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 I leaned in and, and, and I went, choke on. And, and he just, he, he leaned back and he was like, you got it. And the other one that uh, I added was the term pasfuck. If you see the scene where Bob is chasing me down the hallway, I fall and I hit my head on the wall and it really hurt. I mean, I was very, very angry uh, that I had slipped it and bumped my head. I didn't know if I was going to have a bruise, but I couldn't cut it. And I was repeating the, you know, the line, uh, you fuck, you fuck. And then I hit my head and I said, you pus fuck. You pus fuck. And in a couple of seconds later, they cut the scene and the sound guy said, excuse me, George. And George said, yeah. He goes, did, did he say pus fuck? And George said, yeah. And he said, I like it. I'm going to keep it. You fuck! You fuck, fuck! It took a good eight hours. It's funny, the film is called Day of the Dead, uh, but each, each main character's death scene took about a day. Uh, like Gary's death scene, and uh, but mine was the longest uh, in terms of technical, so they saved it for the last day of shooting. Uh, and I walked in early in the morning, and uh, they said, well, it's a good day to die. And I said, yeah, this is when I had had the whole conversation with George while I was waiting for a choke on him. And the... Um, one of the PAs came up to me and said, I really advise that you don't drink any coffee or water or have anything to eat. And I was said, that's a very strange request. And I said, why is that? She said, because you're going to be in a hole in the ground for about six to eight hours. So they uh, stripped me down into... Uh, long johns, long underwear, and walked me over and there was this false floor that was built and there was a hole in the floor and somebody had the bright idea, they put a toilet seat uh, over the hole. I put the, the toilet seat around my neck as though I was an astronaut crawling into this hole. So I literally slid into the hole and they, put, so all that was showing of me was about from here up and the rest, and they put a pillow underneath me and I had my arms were free. And then they started with the appliances. They brought in the, the false set of legs, uh, the pants, the, the false torso. Uh, and then they had to slip the shirt around that and, uh, the, the, the torso and was attached and then there, there was a, a, a flap cavity in the false torso. And this is where things got, and now we're about already three hours into this. And now they bring out the guts that they have to fill the torso with. And uh, Apparently, to this day, they don't know if somebody did it intentionally or if it was a mistake, but the power to the refrigerator had been shut off for the 10 days that they were in Florida. So when they opened up these pig guts, the smell just exploded in the room. I mean, it was like 20 homicide cases but it was just, it, it, it was, I could still smell it to this day. It was the most revolting smell. And people were barfing and 
we we still had another two hours to go on the setup of the shot and they're you know they're standing there they they finally got me a uh, a respirator mask and there were people walking around spraying cologne trying to just uh and and all the the special effect people were wearing masks and you know because they had to pack this because it was a one-shot thing they had to pack this thing kind of anatomically correct and get the guts on and not get blood on the shirt so i mean it was a very very tedious tedious which took about another two and a half hours of laying there in the most uncomfortable position in the world uh, i was starting to lose uh, feeling in my arms and in my legs because of the pressure point and uh you know, finally, after six hours, they got the thing all set, and uh, they told they had they had certain pieces of meat to the side of me that couldn't be seen that were edible because they couldn't have the actors playing the zombies, you know, eating pig guts to begin with, let alone rancid pig guts. Uh, so they had three cameras rolling, um, and we knew we had one shot at it. And it was action, and the the zombies just—they had already found me in the closet, and the, the, they they just swooped down on me and started. One pair started, three or four actually started ripping me apart, and that and I and I'm breathing <gasps> from the pain, and so I'm in, inhaling all of this and inhaling all of this, and. Uh, then they start pulling up my legs and I'm watching my legs go down the hallway and I see bubs in the background, you know, saluting me. Uh, and I know I have to deliver this line choke on them and and I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to retch. I, 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 I can't take it anymore. The smell is just, because now you're really inhaling and you're working and, and, you know, bits of it are flying up and blood is dripping down in under the hole now into it so i took a couple deep breaths and i did that <gasps> and then choke on um and i breathe again choke on um and i'm praying to hear cut and as soon as they said cut i think it's on um one of savini's scream greats um uh, i just lost it i when they said cut, I just started heaving. Now, there was nothing in me. It was dry heaves, but I was, I, they were worried that I was going to suffocate because I was in the hole. I couldn't breathe. So these two guys came over and they just, you know, grabbed me by the arms, pulled me up. I had no sensation in my legs, so I couldn't stand. And they're holding me and I'm covered in blood and smell and guts and I'm just retching and retching. <laughs> horrible, horrible. I could still smell it. Terrible. Lori was from Pittsburgh. I knew Lori. Tim DeLeo was from Pittsburgh. I knew Tim. John was from Pittsburgh. I knew John. Uh, uh, Richard Liberty came up from Florida. We got along famously. Um, Gary Clark, Ralph, the late Ralph uh, Marrero, um, was killed in a car accident. There was something about the fact that we were uh, we weren't on a set where you each had your own let, uh, Winnebago. Uh, we actually had, we were in this mine where, where they had almost set up a sort of barracks. We had cots where we could lay down if we got tired. But the thing was, is we spent all day together. Uh, it wasn't like you could go off. You couldn't leave. You, you had to take a golf cart and drive a mile and a half. This is how big this underground mine was. There was a lake in there. You were warned not to wander off on your own because you could get lost. The camaraderie uh, was wonderful, and and, and I, I noticed that on Dawn and Night Riders too. A lot of it does have to do with the te the the tone and the tempo that George sets uh, on the set. He's very relaxed. There's no 
you know, acting out or temper tantrums. Uh, there's not enough budget for temper tantrums anyway. Uh, but um, it was a good ensemble. <laughs> You know, again, I think that that's a point that uh, uh, probably George intentionally did not start out to make, but you know, you can, you, 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 of course you look at it in retrospect, but I think that that adds again to the, to the, the, the sense of immediacy uh, of the situation that these scientists were trying anything. I mean, there's that horrible scene where the zombie's head is completely off, and then the other scene where he takes the drill and 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 puts it that the des desperate uh, times call for uh, desperate measures. Logan was a little bit excessive uh, in terms of some of the. Uh, experiments but on the other the the other hand if you went Rhodes would just say well the hell with that kill them put them in the oven they're 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 marked they're 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 vermin you better know I mean it too people that wasn't very nice you know that wasn't very nice at all I think basically uh, it, it, it was, which is another thing that killed us in terms of the box office and how many theaters that they uh, considered for distribution or the amount of money. Uh, that kind of a uh, visual uh, visual gore and then the use of profanity fucking shit fucking shit fucking shit fucking shit fucking shit motherfucker uh were two strikes against it i'm surprised it, it didn't get an x rating but uh uh certainly we didn't feel good about it it was uh it was but i i you know George isn't thinking about that when he's shooting, uh, you know, and uh, I'm sure now if it came out today, it would be rated what? I don't know. It would be R, right? In a minute, in a heartbeat. Uh, I don't even know if, is it still considered unrated with the, no, it, it's, it's, it's now, you know, uh, but it's funny. My daughter is 15 uh, and she still ha refuses to watch it. And I'm going, come on, well, you, you, it's your dad, honey. She goes, I, I hate zombie movies. I don't want to see it. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, okay. It got a very, very limited screen release. The premiere was, and the reception was a bit of a letdown uh, for all of us. You know, at, at the time, uh, that it was made, the, the conventions really hadn't started and the, the genre base was just kind of starting to, to snowball, but uh, it, it, we, we disappeared, I mean, we literally disappeared for, you know, 18, well, no, no, let's see, 84, yeah, until about 2000 uh, is when we started getting requests to, uh, to do uh, to, to do to do shows now. George has always said, I don't know if it still applies because he's got a couple more pictures out under his belt. 
but he, he has always said in terms of the trilogy, uh, uh, Night, Dawn, and Day, that it's his favorite. Uh, it's his favorite. So, you know, we feel uh, a little bit... Uh, we were a little bit underrated, but people, the more people watched it, uh, and I've, I've had many, many fans say that to me, you know, the more I watch that, uh, the more I realize that there's just so much going on in that, in that movie, uh, besides being a zombie movie. What happened to this one? It was too unruly, I couldn't handle it, I had to destroy it. We can still get information from it. God, that's a painful question, uh, because I, the next project I did after Day of the Dead was a movie for Ron Howard called Gung Ho that was shot in Pittsburgh. And I thought it would be a wise move. Uh, I, I, I was gonna do it right after Day, but I knew I had Gung Ho coming up. I, I thought then it would be a wise move to move to LA. And I thought that I certainly would be gobbled up by uh, the genre directors. Um, and uh, that wasn't the case. I don't know if uh, managerially uh, I, got, I got involved in something that was a, a huge rave for about 10 years called Murder Mystery Theater. Um, a dinner theater and I, I did a impression of Lieutenant Columbo, and you know, so I was the chief detective. And we were quite successful. Uh, we were doing, you know, four or five shows a week. I did an episode of uh, uh, a show called Briscoe County, and uh, Andrew Devoff, you know him from Wishmaster, was, was playing the main, it was a pirate. We were pirates in the Old West. And um, Bruce Campbell was the star of the show. Bruce, he played Briscoe. So, you know, and I kind of thought that after Day, you know, I would, I would at least be getting half the work that, let's say, Bruce Campbell uh, got, or, you know, Jeffrey Combs, who I know very well. But I do say if there are any budding directors out there that want Captain Rhodes, you will know how to find me because uh, I have a lot of work left in me. My biggest heartbreak was that when I moved out in 86, I got a phone call from uh, Bob Kurtzman, KNBFX at that time. Um, and he said, uh, would you like to attach yourself to a project? I said, I'll attach myself to a fire hydrant. I, I, I don't care. And I said, what, what's the project? Uh, and he goes, he goes, it's, he goes it's, it's, just, it's a low budget, Joe, it's strictly low budget, but it is union. Uh, it's called From Dawn Till Dusk. And this really neat kid that works in a video store wrote it and I said, oh, I said, what's his name? And he, said, and he goes, Quentin Tarantino. And I said, oh, another Italian. I said, good. This is, you know, how, early, how, how careers just go to the left and, and go to the right. So uh, he said, why don't you come over? I'm having a party, you'll get to meet him. I went over and we had the party and he goes, Joe, this is Quentin. And Quentin was like, Joe Pilato, Captain Rose. You know, I can't believe it. I have so many questions. And I went, da 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 well, we shot, and it's available on the internet, the trailer, and it looks beautiful. We shot in Panavision. Um, and what really, really pisses me off is what was happening at the time. Uh, Quentin had used the startup money he received for payment of writing Dust Till Dawn to, uh, to start a, a little project called Reservoir Dogs. So we shot this beautiful trailer uh, and I realized as I look, because I come out in this black suit and I've got this gun and they cut the line out, uh, but I make the sign of the cross 
and I cock the gun and I put it by mouth and then I turn and I go eyeball the camera and I go you want blood you got blood and there I am in the classic be, even before Reservoir Dogs comes out there's Joe Pilato in the black suit the white shirt and the black tie that classic look that came out of dawn till dusk and um, um, or dusk till dawn did I get it backwards again I, 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 can't, I can't remember but um, which is why Quentin put me in, you know in Pulp Fiction as, as Dean Martin has my career uh, gone the way I thought it would have or perhaps justifiably should have um, didn't happen didn't happen and I'm a good bad guy I mean I'm a good bad guy so you know you know I I, I have I, everybody that I talk to says it's terrible um, I know it's a completely different story uh, you know I always tell the joke at conventions that uh, the reason they cast Ving Rhames as Captain Rhodes is because they wanted somebody with a smaller penis uh, you know did, which is just just you know a kind of a, a joke on the on the fact that the, they they would go from you know Captain Rhodes is this slight wiry guy in the original to you know this massive hulk of a guy in the remake I haven't seen it. I know they must have spent some money on it because they hired Ving and they hired what's her name from American Beauty. Contagion. Yeah, I I know I have not seen um You know, I it's very you know, I should just out of common interest um and not common courtesy because none of those guys uh, they should have had at least I think the grace to have some of us from the original at least do a cameo as they did uh, with uh, Ken and Scotty in in the remake of uh, of uh, of of Dawn you know um, I mean you know it would have been a nice touch for the fans uh, but they, they were not interested at all But you know, I, I will. Uh, I'll either run across it when I'm flipping, which is how I see most of my movies now. Uh, is just you know flipping through cable. And arrange your trips in the territorial. Uh, but I should put it on my list of the. Uh, but it'll just give me some another reason to grouse, and I'm trying to stay positive and the, uh, you know, and just enjoy you know and just appreciating being with the fans you know finally hopefully with the uh, being cast in uh, Zebediah de Soto's um, remake Night of the Living Dead Origins uh, and having a major role in that although it will be all computer uh, you know generated 3D so it'll be my voice um, I, I haven't even we didn't even see storyboards yet on what we look like we just we just have all the the uh, dialogue in the can so but Zebediah uh, has, has shot something called War Dog and has a very, has shot a few commercials and he's quite brilliant. And the script is very, 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 very close in terms of the storyline and the situation. It's just transferred to uh, present day and uh, as opposed to being a farmhouse somewhere in Pennsylvania, it's a... It's a uh, a brownstone um, in New York uh, where they finally um, huddle together and decide whether to, to leave or not but you have just massive uh, you know 747 going into a building because a zombie outbreak on a plane 
uh, Times Square, people are just dropping left and right. So it's, it's kind of, it, it'll be on a very grand, um, uh, 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 almost Cloverfield kind of sensibility without the, uh, the um, St. Vitus dance camera. <laughs> This last convention I did, there was a theater troupe there that it was the, one of the most brilliant things. They did a 45-minute puppet show version of uh, Night of the Living Dead. They're coming to get you, Barbara. And uh, the zombies would open their mouth and they had these red ribbons that would shoot out of their mouth. Or when a zombie got shot, the puppets top of the puppet's head would open up and these starbursts would come out uh, and, and it just was a tent because it was theatrically executed wonderfully and it, it, it's almost uh, although George wouldn't agree financially but it's almost uh, natural that this story would come into the public domain it would almost be like Aesop's fables because it is you know it is uh, such such a fabulistic um, such a fabulistic story they're coming for you look there comes one of them now when I was in Milwaukee for this uh, zombie con um, they had a panel, and the title of the panel was Should Zombies Walk or Run? And I was saying, I, I, I was saying, you know, my God, I said, we're confronting such major issues right now in debates at, at, at the moment about whether we should have nationalized health or not. Uh, and you guys, you crazy genre fans, are sitting around uh, uh, talking about... Uh, if zombies should uh, should should be walking or or running, and uh, I said, well, it's kind of like sex, isn't it? I mean, most times you like kind of to be kind of slow and a long journey, and sometimes you you know you want that quickie. So, uh, it, 28 days later, they ran. It worked. You had your quickie, and uh, I think George is a little bit more in terms of the you know the sexual act that you want to just kind of enjoy every lumbering uh, 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 moment of that and then somebody asked me they, they talk well what do you think the future I said well I, I think uh, I think somebody is going to come up with the idea of zombie porn soon and that will give a whole new meaning to the expression bite me Really, that I'll have to say that uh, I, I guess uh, I guess that's the that's the safest unsafe sex a person could have would be uh, would be with a zombie or uh, two zombies with, with each other. Uh, eat me literally means eat me, you know. It's kind of, but I'll, I'll have to look that up. You know, we made something, as I said, that is gratefully, gratefully being kept alive by um, a wonderfully caring and generous fan base. And they are getting older and they are passing this. Uh, there's so many father-son combinations now that come to my tables. I, I mean, I don't literally sometimes believe it. Like whole families of people that are dressed like zombies, mother, father, kids, that are just into this, just, you know, into this. And hopefully, um, you know, hopefully that, that'll continue and, uh, you know, I can continue to, uh, to, to, to meet my fans because uh, they happen to like Captain Rhodes. What else do you want? You're giving me a mouthful of Greek salad.
Choke on them. Choke on them.